Welcome back to part two of my Monongahela Railway series. It's the morning following our arrival in Brownsville with a Challenger locomotive on loan from the Clinchfield Railroad. And today, we'll be hauling an empty coal train to Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. We'll also be getting into the details of the Monongahela's fascinating history. It's an unusual railroad in that during the post-highway era when most railroads struggled, the Monongahela's business actually grew until it disappeared at the peak of its performance. Despite its own success, the company was dissolved because the larger railroads that owned it collapsed one by one. Passed from merger to merger, over its time the Monongahela could claim as its parent companies the Pennsylvania, New York Central, the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, Baltimore and Ohio, Penn Central, Conrail, CSX, and Norfolk Southern. Today, the town of Brownsville and West Brownsville are small, quiet villages. But the rows of abandoned buildings hint at a time when the Brownsville area was once a center for coal railroads and barge building. 100 years ago, it looked unrecognizable compared to what we see today. These photos come from the digital library of the University of Pittsburgh and were taken by the Monongahela Railway itself. They show just how busy the town was during the first half of the 20th century. Here is Pennsylvania Railroad train 33 headed by a K4 locomotive loading at the Market Street station bound for Pittsburgh. Three times a day, Pennsylvania trains came down from Pittsburgh and then returned, transferring passengers to the Monongahela Railway for transport up and down the main line to West Virginia. A new five-story Union Station was built in 1928. The station still stands on Market Street at the intersection with Railroad Street, boarded up and empty since its closing in 1950. It's not represented here in the game, but it would be where these last two buildings are, the white and the brick. Here it is under construction in 1928. Railroads had been servicing the area since the 1880s, but as the Monongahela main line reached West Virginia, it seemed appropriate at that time to demolish the original station and rebuild a much more impressive structure. Here's the building's front facade, along with room for shops on busy Market Street. The upper floors contained office space for the Railroad Administration. The superintendent, chief engineer, and their staff were headquartered in Brownsville. A large force of mechanical engineers and draftsmen worked in the drafting rooms in the building. Additionally, commercial office space was rented out to businesses like doctors and insurance companies. This is looking north from the Brownsville Bridge towards what used to be the station tracks, now all long gone. Pennsylvania Railroad and P&LE trains headed north out of the station, while Monongahela trains went south. More freight yards to the north included a tipple reaching out into the river for loading barges. Here's the river retaining wall on the east bank being built in 1918. On the hill above the Coke sign in the background is the old Brownsville High School, now demolished. Across the street behind it is the tower of Nemecolin Castle, now a museum and the home of the Brownsville Historical Society. A real-life K-4 waits at Brownsville Station in December of 1949. By this time, the Pennsylvania and Monongahela only ran one train a day, numbered 806 going south and 833 going north. Passenger service was terminated in October of 1950 due to low ridership. Time now for number 33 to pull out of the station and head for Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania trains would cross the Brownsville Junction Bridge and follow the Penn tracks up the west bank of the river. Just north of Union Station was the junction for the Dunlap branch. The tracks curved through this empty space and followed the retaining wall to a tunnel that passed under Market Street. Google Maps seem to show several houses built in front of the tunnel, so it's hard to see what's really there, but supposedly 
It is still there, running under the street. At the Dunlap Branch Junction was a freight station built in 1918. The building is still mostly there as well, butted up against Albany Street, but in really bad shape. The distinctive cupola roof can be seen from the road. S-33 continues north, we're back at the Brownsville Junction Y, which we talked about last time. Originally, this intersection connected the West Brownsville Yards with another pen yard behind us, the Monongahela Yards to the south, and the P&LE Yards to the north. So here we are, finally, back in our E1 class Challenger number 651 across the river in the Pennsylvania yards of West Brownsville. We are already coupled to our train, which this time is going to give our Challenger a proper workout. Behind us are 120 H21A coal hoppers. Each car empty weighs 50,100 pounds and is 42 feet long. That gives our train a length of 5,040 feet, and with the added length of caboose and locomotive, we are over a mile long, stem to stern. The weight will be 3,028 tons, plus the 537 tons of locomotive, for a total today of 3,565 tons. Now, just a clarification, last video I said, uh, sort of offhand, that the Challenger weighed 2 million pounds, but that's wrong. It's actually only 1 million and change, but when I wrote the number down in my notes, I forgot a zero, so it became 1.7 million instead of 1.07 million. I did use the correct number for my math calculations, so total train weight was still correct. I just said the wrong thing out loud. So with those corrections aside, and knowing that we're using all the correct numbers this time, we have a mile-long train of 3,500 tons to take up to the mine, and we're going to do it with a single locomotive, unassisted. Now honestly, getting up there isn't going to really be the problem. It's once we fill those coal cars, and our weight will be doubled when we're coming back down the mountain, and that's, uh, that's when things will be a little more interesting. We're not scheduled to leave for a few more minutes, so before we get going, let's take a look around the cab at our various controls and gauges. Beginning on our left, we see our speedometer, which winds all the way up to 90 miles per hour. We're not going to see anything near that here. The most we'll see today is 40 due to speed limits. Boiler pressure is above that. Max pressure is 280 PSI, and the safety valve lifts at 278 to make sure that we don't explode. Above is the sight glass which would show us boiler level if it worked, but it's non-functional here. In front and above is an in-cab signaling system, which is also non-operational, but in real life would show the current signal status of the block that we're in. This equipment was mandatory after 1946, when a fatal crash in Illinois prompted a federal speed limit of 79 miles per hour. All locomotives were required to have in-cab signaling in any area where passenger trains hit 80 miles per hour. Next to the signaling device is the gauge for steam chest pressure, which is how much steam is reaching the cylinders. Below that is our brake gauges. The red hand on the left gauge shows me what my brake cylinder pressure is, and the right hand shows available pressure in the reservoir. Looking at the main control cluster, this is our train brake, or automatic brake controlling all of the brakes along the entire length of the train. And this is our independent or locomotive brake, which controls only the locomotive and tender. Behind those is the sander, which drops sand from the locomotive onto the rails in front of the driving wheels, giving them extra traction. This is needed for slippery conditions, starting a heavy train, or heavy braking. Next is our regulator-reverser combo. This is the throttle or regulator because it regulates steam pressure to the cylinders. The reverser adjusts the cutoff of the piston or how long steam is admitted during the piston stroke and this adjusts efficiency of the cylinders. The throttle is often set and left in place 
and speed adjustments are made with the reverser only. An easy way to think of it is that the regulator makes coarse adjustments to speed and the reverser makes fine adjustments. For starting a train, maximum torque is needed so the reverser is full forward as the throttle is opened. As speed comes up, the reverser is brought incrementally back towards neutral. In old engineer speak, this was called hooking up. Hooking up the train reduces torque but makes the piston use less steam, saving fuel and boiler pressure. We have three sets of Venturi tubes on board, which I talked about in the first episode a little bit. Live steam injector and exhaust steam injectors for filling the boiler, and the blower for maintaining a draft through the firebox. You'll hear me use the term air ejectors a lot without thinking, which is wrong, uh, but it's a throwback to my steam system days in the Navy. We used air ejectors to draw a vacuum on the main engines, but the reason I use that term is because they use the same principle as these injectors, which is using Venturi tubes to pull a vacuum on another system. So simply put, a Venturi tube is a tapered pipe, and as air, steam, or water move through it, the shape of the tube speeds the fluid up, which then causes a pressure drop. That vacuum can then be used to draw another fluid into the tube, such as water from the tender. Once the steam pulls that water in, it then mixes or entrains, and then it pushes the water into the boiler. So you have a little push-pull combo happening there. And I think that'll do it for a basic overview for now, because it's about time that we get going. We're scheduled to get underway at 10 past the hour, so let's hit it. All right, making preparations to get underway now. We want full torque for starting out, so reverser is going to go full forward. Release the independent brake and release the train brake. And we want maximum traction for the drivers, so sander is on and... There we go, brake pressure is dropping down to zero. So the cylinder cocks are open, and we're going to crack open the throttle. Bell on for safety while we are low speed through the yard. We're keeping an eye on that steam coming out of the cylinder cocks. The cylinders are cold right now, so lots of wet steam as water condenses. And then as soon as it's dry steam, or fairly dry steam, then we'll close up the cylinder cocks. On our left are two Monongahela L-Class Mikados. 179 would have been an L1, and 199 was an L3B, which was a series of locomotives bought second-hand from the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad in 1947. Okay, speed is up to 3 miles an hour. I'm going to crack the throttle open another 10%. And now that the brakes are fully released, we're going to set the handle in running, the running position. And we're going to start pulling back on the reverser. As the speed comes up, I want to be able to open the throttle more to give the locomotive more power, but we don't want to spin the wheels, so we're going to pull the reverser back. It's sort of a dance between the two until we can reach sort of an equilibrium that's going to give us the most power for getting up to our speed limit. Speed limit here in the yards is 10 miles an hour, and it will continue to be down all the way through Main Street in West Brownsville. As we head out of the Pennsylvania Yards, we are paralleling Main Street to our right and coming up on the Nelson Street crossing 
at the south end of the yard. The neighborhood to our left along Middle Street is West Brownsville proper, while to our right up 2nd Boulevard is the community of Blainsburg, a small village up the hill that merged with West Brownsville in 1985. We're a mile back now in Caboose 210. This is the brake valve the brakeman would use to apply or release the train brakes to communicate with the locomotive in times before radio, like we talked about in episode one. Here the track intercepts Main Street to begin the famous street running portion through West Brownsville. Technically, it's considered a railroad crossing, making it one of the longest crossings in the U.S. The tracks have run down Main Street since the Pennsylvania's arrival in 1881, originally only to service the Axton and Pringle Boatyard, one of the Monongahela River's largest steamship and barge builders. It was once much more commonplace to find rails embedded in roads, Examples could be found in almost every state in the U.S., but now many of the lines have been either abandoned or ripped out and less and less of them remain. Another notable example still in use is in LaGrange, Kentucky, where CSX runs daily through its busy city center. Keeping a special eye on the speed here, I'm actually seeing it creep up. We're at 10.1 now, so pulling the reverser back to uh, around 5%, we may have to shut the throttle and apply brakes if necessary, but I'm going to try to avoid that if I can. Main Street is ever so slightly downhill, so especially as more of the train gets behind us onto the street, the weight will start pushing us up if we don't watch out, so just something to keep an eye on as we slowly make our way down the road. Pittsburgh Road climbs the hill to our right into Blainesville, and just beyond it is the West Brownsville Police Station and Municipal Building. In 1950, it still would have been the original A&P grocery store. Across the street from the A&P is the birthplace of Senator James Blaine, U.S. Secretary of State under two different presidents, and was the man walking next to President James Garfield when he was shot and assassinated in a Washington train station. Blainesville, up the hill, was named for him. Passing under the Route 40 bridge, on our left we have the now abandoned schoolhouse built in 1940. We see this building model used all throughout this route in the sim as a generic building, but this is the real site of the school, and uh, this is the building that the model is based off of, so it actually looks just like this here in this spot.
There's the Brownsville Bridge back there, crossing over the river. At the end of the street, we'll pass two churches on our left. First, the Apostolic Temple, and then the Ornate Holy Resurrection Orthodox Church. It's very common to find Orthodox churches in areas related to coal mining because so many miners were Eastern European immigrants. This is the Bridge Boulevard crossing. To our left is the Brownsville Bridge opened in 1914 and connecting Brownsville to West Brownsville. In the 40s and 50s, when the towns were at their peak, the bridge was often so packed with cars that police officers were needed to direct traffic at both ends. With the construction of the Route 40 overpass in 1962, traffic through the town dropped dramatically. We finally leave Main Street, and to our left along the shore was the site of the Axton and Pringle Boatworks, built in 1844 when John S. Pringle moved his steamship yards from across the river. The site covered 10 acres and produced around nine steamboats per year for the river trade. This was the southern extent of the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks until the 1920s. The company was gone and the lot was vacant by 1901 as the steamship business collapsed in favor of railroads. So the locomotive is in a 30 mile an hour zone, but you can see here that the caboose is only just hitting the beginning of Main Street, so the train is still restricted to 10 miles an hour. For an uptick in speed, you can't accelerate the train until the, the very end passes by that speed limit sign, so we'll be maintaining 10 through town here. Now some places do have special rules. On the street running portion in LaGrange, uh, from what I understand, there's a low speed limit until the locomotive is actually beyond the crossing, you know, beyond the street running portion, and then the train is allowed to speed up to, uh, to a higher, you know, 25 miles an hour or whatever it is. The danger has passed of hitting somebody with the front of the train, and it's less likely that someone's going to, to hit the side of the train, and so that gets it past the, uh, the street running portion faster, but I don't know if there's any such restrictions here in town in uh, West Brownsville, so we're just stuck with 10 miles an hour creeping along until we pass... Uh, Bridge Street with the caboose. Off to our right, Main Street has turned into the historic National Pike Road. This was the first improved highway in the United States and was built between 1811 and 1837. It passed through Brownsville as it connected the Potomac River to the Ohio River out in Illinois. It was the main transport path to the west for thousands of settlers. And there's our caboose passing by the Pittsburgh Street Five and Dime, or um, not Five and Dime, the A&P grocery store. The National Pike has forked off to the right to climb the hill, and now Low Hill Road stays parallel with us. On our left across the Monongahela, we can just see the south end of Brownsville, and the Brownsville Brewery through the trees. This was a pre-Prohibition era brewery operating from 1862 until 1917. After it closed as a brewery, the building became the Brownsville Ice Factory. So we're in a pretty good steady state right now, 10 miles an hour on the dot, 30% regulator, 5% reverser, 
And uh, we have plenty of draft through the firebox, so I can secure the blower. We don't need that on anymore. We are across from the Brownsville Yards now, also just visible through the trees. These were the Monongahela's main yards, and were sometimes referred to as being in South Brownsville. Today the area is so sparse, I think it's difficult for words to convey just how different the yards looked a hundred years ago. So here's a couple of photographs to show you the incredible difference instead. Here's one of the real Monongahela locomotives. This is an H5SA class 280, built by Alco's Pittsburgh plant in 1917. Here's a close-up view of the erecting shop, off to the side of the roundhouse next to the river. The erecting shop was where the railroad built, or repaired, locomotives, rail cars, or any other heavy equipment they needed. Another real locomotive. This is what the Monongahela L1s looked like in real life. Number 174 was built in 1918 in Alco Schenectady plant. Here it sits in South Brownsville with a dangerously overfilled tender. Low Hill Road, still out to our right, paralleling us. We're going to be coming up on the 40 mile an hour speed sign, which means that the train is so long that we'll actually be in the 40 mile an hour zone and a 30 and a 10. The ass end of the train is still going to be in town for a few more seconds. So as soon as the caboose clears that, we're going to be clear to just pull the throttle wide open and really get this thing going. The story of the Monongahela begins in 1881 when the Pittsburgh, Virginia, and Charleston Railway arrived in the small town of West Brownsville. The PV&C was a subsidiary of the already powerful Pennsylvania Railroad, which was at that time already snaking out through Ohio towards Chicago and the Midwest. The PV&C followed the west bank of the Monongahela River, connecting passengers and freight from the valley to the industry of Pittsburgh. The river had already been busy with coal barge traffic for 60 years at that point, so many cities and mines had grown along its bank that were ripe for railroad connections. The Pennsylvania Railroad was eager to exploit profits from the Monongahela Valley, so one year later, in 1882, they expanded the PV&C tracks to the east, constructing the West Brownsville Junction Bridge across the river and following the Redstone Creek to the east and south. The Redstone Branch, as it was called, serviced mills, mines, and several coke furnace facilities before it finally reached Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Uniontown was important to the PV&C, and by extension the Pennsylvania, because it provided a connection to two other railroads, the Baltimore and Ohio, and the Southwest Pennsylvania, itself another Pensy subsidiary that traveled north back to the main line to Harrisburg. Around 1900, the PV&C ceased to be its own entity, as it was incorporated back into the Pennsylvania Railroad. Pennsylvania's rival, the New York Central, soon sent their own subsidiary into the area. The Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad was built along the east bank of the Monongahela River, arriving in Brownsville in 1890. The B&O already had control of the rich coal fields in western Maryland and West Virginia, and as the 19th century came to a close, the Pennsylvania and New York Central decided that a joint venture might be the best way to lay claim on new coal business, and to prevent the B&O from expanding. It would also maximize the efficiency of both companies' coal assets already in the area. The Pennsylvania Railroad, with their yards in West Brownsville, and the New York Central, through the P&LE on the East Bank, put aside their animosity and incorporated a new company as equal owners in 1900, the Monongahela Railroad. The Monongahela Railroad acquired all the tracks on the east bank in the Brownsville area, 
which was to be its base of operations. The corporate offices remained in Pittsburgh, but the superintendent, all the operations staff, the chief engineer and all his staff were headquartered in Brownsville. The main line, at the time, ran for only 19 miles down the east bank of the river, to Ada, Pennsylvania. The railroad made its first expansion in 1905, when it leased the Connellsville and Monongahela Railway. This line was 27 miles long and ran south out of town to follow the Dunlap Creek to the town of La Crone. Here, the railroad could connect to the B&O. The last few miles of the line curved around to head back to the Monongahela River at the town of Huron. This line would eventually be integrated fully into the Monongahela Railroad and became known as the Dunlap Branch. By 1911, business was good for the Monongahela. The railroad was servicing seven mines and 51 coke works. It now looked to expand to the south and the state line extension was built and opened in 1912. The Monongahela Railroad main line now ran from Brownsville to the West Virginia border, where it connected with the Buchanan and Northern, or BNN, at the state line. The BNN had a troubled beginning and came under the control of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad, the Monongahela's parent company. In 1915, the BNN and the Monongahela Railroad were merged to become the Monongahela Railway. After acquiring the BNN assets, the Monongahela now had a 69-mile mainline from Brownsville, PA to Fairmont, West Virginia. Included in the merger was the Paw Paw Branch, already servicing a mine in Loveridge, West Virginia, and a new major connection with the B&O at Reevesville. Now stretched to its full length, the Monongahela made a very profitable existence for the following decade. We are directly across the river from the Alicia Coke ovens. In the 30s and 40s, we would have been able to see the enormous traveling crane that stretched out into the river for barge loading. We're crossing over the Main Street underpass in Denbo, Pennsylvania. Coming up on the Vesta Street crossing, and the Monfaya Expressway is directly ahead and above us. The next milestone in the railroad's history came in 1926, when the B&O was allowed to purchase one-third of the Monongahela stock, making them an equal partner with the Pennsylvania and the P&LE. This was a huge windfall for the Monongahela because the B&O's involvement allowed the railroad to acquire three important B&O subsidiary railroads. In West Virginia, the Indian Creek and Northern Railroad was a three-mile line that ran to two large mines in Arnettsville. The Morgantown and Wheeling Railroad was attempting to build a 20-mile line along Scott's Run, but ran out of money and was purchased by the Monongahela. The Scott's Run branch was a harsh line full of steep grades and tight curves, but it proved to be a staggering source of income. The first four miles alone serviced 36 coal mines. After acquiring the line, the Monongahela rapidly finished construction up to Brave, Pennsylvania, just over the state line. 
The third B&O acquisition was up to the north in Pennsylvania. The Chartier Southern Railroad operated on the west bank of the Monongahela, running from Crucible to Millsboro, then inland along the Ten Mile Creek to Mather. Once the Chartier Southern belonged to the Monongahela, the first tracks south out of West Brownsville were constructed, following the river's west bank to connect to Millsboro. The tracks along the rest of the west bank would eventually be extended to the town of Nemecolin, earning it the name Nemecolin Branch. The other line, following the Ten Mile Creek, was the Ten Mile Branch. By 1930, the Nemecolin branch had reached its namesake, and the Ten Mile branch was extended out to Waynesburg. In Waynesburg, the Monongahela connected with yet another Pennsylvania subsidiary, the narrow gauge Waynesburg and Washington Railway. The W and W was a small but beloved local railroad that swerved and snaked its way up to Washington, Pennsylvania. From there, the Pennsylvania Railroad connected riders north to Pittsburgh. The W&W had been in operation since 1877 and had a small yard and engine services in Waynesburg. When the Monongahela arrived in 1930, it overlapped the W&W in town with gauntlet-style double track. As the 1920s ended, so did the Monongahela's peak passenger years. The company had supported passenger service since 1915 along the main line from Brownsville to Fairmont and along the Nemecolin and Ten Mile branches. The Pennsylvania Railroad brought riders from Pittsburgh to connect at both the Brownsville Union Station and at Millsboro. Brownsville Union Station was built in 1928 on Market Street. A medium yard of several tracks sat behind it, and it was serviced by trains of the Monongahela, Pennsylvania Railroad, and the PNLE. With the dawn of the 1930s and the Depression, though, passenger numbers began to decline then dropped sharply following the start of World War II. The railroad fell on hard times in general after the Depression, despite the upswing in wartime traffic. Equipment was wearing out due to deferred maintenance, as the B&O and Pennsylvania were having money problems of their own and couldn't afford to invest money in their subsidiaries. Passenger service was reduced in the 1940s to save money until only a single daily train remained. Branch line traffic was cut first, then finally, in the fall of 1950, the Monongahela dropped all passenger service completely. We're once again in a generic caboose, and you can see from the phone and the speaker that it's not really accurate for the 40s or 50s, but it's good enough as a substitute. Monongahela cabooses were originally red in color, but in the 80s and 90s, they were repainted into a much more colorful teal. In 1976, caboose number 64 was painted red, white, and blue for the country's bicentennial celebration. All of the railroad's early cabooses were wood in construction. Only 10 metal cabooses were purchased new, and they came from the International Railway Car and Equipment Manufacturing Company of Kenton, Ohio. They arrived in 1949, and four remained in service all the way until 1990. They were finally replaced by second-hand bay window style units. The cabooses came with bunks for a five-man train crew, oil lamps, and a coal stove. Later, electric lights replaced the oil lamps, and two of the bunks were removed for a bathroom. It looks like several of the original Monongahela cabooses have survived. Number 67 is at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg, PA. Number 71 is in Brownsville, and 64 is up the road in Centerville. Number 73 is located at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum in Washington, Pennsylvania. Number 73 was the last of the metal cabooses from the 1949 order, and was donated to the museum by the railroad in 1991.
On our left out in the river is the Maxwell Lock and Dam. This lock was built in 1965, taking the place of dismantled original locks at both Brownsville and Rice's Landing. Despite the loss of passenger service, the 1950s saw a resurgence for the railroad, and beginning in 1952, 27 S12 switchers were purchased from Baldwin. The diesels were cheaper to run and less maintenance heavy, and it was much easier to run multiple locomotives on heavy trains than it had been with steam locomotives. As a consequence, all the railroad steam was retired by 1954. Business continued to grow into the 1960s, and more power was needed. Nine second-hand RF-16 shark noses and two B units arrived from the New York Central to help tackle the ever-increasing demands of the railroad. The 1960s were a tough time for many railroads as air travel and the new highway systems were driving business down. The Monongahela, on the other hand, began to prosper during this time. Business was so good that a major new construction was authorized, the first in 30 years. In 1968, the Waynesburg Southern Branch was opened for business. This 27-mile C-shaped line would curve around to connect Waynesburg to the Brave, Blacksville, and Federal Mines at the state line. The line was designed with gentle curves and light slopes, much better suited to the increasing size of railroad cars and locomotives. With its declining business and difficult tracks, the old Scott Run Branch was abandoned in 1968 and the tracks were pulled up in the 70s. In addition to Scott's run, by 1965, both the Arnettsville branch and the Nemecolin branch had been discontinued. The Arnettville tracks were pulled up in 1963, but the Nemecolin line would remain abandoned in place until 2000, when the roadbed was converted to a paved rails-to-trails walk called the Green River Trail. The Dunlap branch out of Brownsville also played out, and was abandoned in 1976, with the tracks pulled up sometime after that. The railroad was moving more coal than ever, and its old S-12s were wearing out, so new locomotives were needed. In 1969, five brand new GP-38s were purchased, and in 1974, nine GP-7s were purchased second-hand from the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie. We are passing the small community of Maple Glen with Low Hill Road to our right. Just as we pass Maple Glen crossing, the Karen Mine would have been directly to our right across the road. A conveyor crossed the road and tracks to the industrial area on our left, which housed coal facilities and a tipple for loading barges. So just to our left there in this big industrial area, this was originally a coal processing area, so there would have been a big mound of coal and a tipple going out into the river, probably a bunch of barges right along the, the shoreline. We're now in Vestaburg, and just after this small industrial area on the left, would have been the beginning of a rail yard. Across the river is the LaBelle coal ash dump, and a large coal conveyor crossed the river here into the yard for loading and unloading of waste materials. It was in full operation in the 1950s, but even today we would be passing under a small remaining section of it. We made it to 38 and a half miles an hour for the high speed portion of our run, but now we have a 30 mile an hour zone coming up ahead, so I'm on the train brakes, jockeying the pressure to bring us down under the 30 before we hit the uh, the yellow marker coming up right here. Oop. And momentum is actually pushing us back up over 30, so back on the brakes as we come around the corner, mile post 66 right before this crossing. Just after the yards, we cross Front Street, followed immediately by Bealesville Road.
Front Street, or Route 88, is on our left now as we come into Fredericktown. That little shack is a municipal building, and just after where the road splits used to be the location of a ferry to cross the river. So that 40 mile an hour zone behind us, that's the fastest we're going to get today. Everything from here on out is going to be 30 or less. In fact, the next town we're coming up on in just a few minutes is Millsboro, and we'll be leaving the Monongahela River transition to following the 10 mile creeks that's going to drop us down to 15 to get around a tight right curve so that'll be a pretty slow speed that we have to maintain to get the whole train around the the curve then we'll be able to speed back up to i think it's a 30 mile an hour zone again on our left is the fredericktown fire department just before the crawford road crossing To our left and right are old mine dumps, something that we're going to see littered across the countryside here in coal country. A wharf and tipple used to be in the river here as well. We're coming up on Millsboro, Pennsylvania, an important town that was also known as Ten Mile Run Junction. It was here that the Nemecolon branch split off to the left to follow the west bank of the Monongahela River, and the Ten Mile Run branch split west towards Waynesburg, which is where we're going. The Nemecolon was abandoned in the 60s, but as we go around the curve, we can still see the remains of the bridge that crossed the Ten Mile Creek to the south. I've got a touch of brakes applied, slowing us down. We're coming up on that 15 mile an hour zone just around this curve here. Yeah, you can see just ahead. So here's the Ferry Street crossing. That's Mill Street over to our right, and it looks like once upon a time that crossed the tracks right about here in a second uh, grade crossing, connecting over with Front Street on our left, but it looks like that's been abandoned for many years now at this point. 1984 saw the most recent change to the railroad's infrastructure. The Waynesburg and Washington Railroad had declined and finally gone out of business in the 70s, but its roadbed would be part of a new branch opening to the Bailey Mine in Graysville, Pennsylvania. The new Manor Branch, as it was called, left from Waynesburg and continued along the Brown Creek until reaching the mine. With the dawn of the 1990s, the Monongahela was hauling 30 million tons of coal per year, 10 times more than it had during the 70s. So, another order of locomotives was placed. The 11 Super 7Rs purchased from General Electric would turn out to be the last locomotive order by the Monongahela. Okay, we're officially in the 15 mile an hour zone as we're coming around the Millsboro curve and just approaching milepost 68. I'm going to start looking over to the left here. The, the old Nemecolon Branch Bridge should be visible through the trees any moment.
The 10 mile branch split off to the right here. There would have been a switch here and should be right on the other side of these trees, I think. Yep, there it is. So you can see that one of the tracks would have gone straight down onto the Nemecolon branch and then headed south down along the, the west banks of the Monongahela River. The Green Cove Yacht Club is down in the Ten Mile Creek to our left. This is a much newer addition. This whole area was mostly empty in 1950. Only a few houses and a large warehouse dotted the roadside. Boiler water levels down to 65%, so I'm going to go ahead and open the exhaust injectors and start pumping some water into the boiler to get that level back up. Now is maybe the perfect time to give the disclaimer that the way I'm operating this locomotive is not how you would do it in real life. The injectors would pretty much be on the whole time, trying to provide as much of a steady state as possible. So you would just have them on and then you would be adjusting them, adjusting their rate rather, to inject just enough water to maintain a uh, perfect boiler level. You actually don't want too much. A very high boiler level would cause problems with the superheating process in locomotives that have superheaters and also would affect uh, lubrication. And then obviously too low of a level, you damage the crown sheet or possibly explode the boiler. Uh, also something that you really don't want. But another problem would be to just let the boiler go down and then dump a bunch of cold water into it. That's bad too long term for the for the thermal stress of extreme heat differences you know cold water coming into the very hot boiler but also you would have a more pressing effect of severely decreasing the pressure available in your boiler so if you needed that to do actual work you'd be in a bit of trouble the same actually applies to the coal stoker as well the stoker should be running the whole time sprinkling just enough coal onto the fire to maintain it at the minimum amount needed for the locomotive to do its work Pouring too much coal onto the fire would smother it and uh, would kill the fire and then you would lose steam pressure and this was called dying on a full stomach. And often junior inexperienced firemen would see a decrease in pressure and assume that the fire was too light and then would open up the coal stoker more which would then just compound the problem because the fire was already too thick or the coal wasn't distributed evenly in the firebox. And this particular Challenger model is quite old, and it doesn't model any of those nuances, so it doesn't really matter. You can be pretty abusive with this locomotive, and nothing is going to happen in-game, which is why I don't, I'm not too worried about it right now. But I figured I would at least explain what really would be happening uh, a little bit in real life. Maybe we'll get into more of that a little bit later. The caboose is still all the way back in Millsboro, hasn't even made it around the Nemecolon Bridge yet. The railroad was still massively successful, with modern and well-maintained equipment, but the Monongahela's owners were failing. The Pennsylvania, New York Central, and New Haven Railroads formally merged in 1968 to become Penn Central, which almost immediately went bankrupt and collapsed in 1976. The Monongahela found itself now co-owned by the newly formed Conrail and an independent Pittsburgh and Lake Erie. The third owner, the B&O, disappeared in 1987 as it was merged with half a dozen other railroads to create CSX Transportation. The p and -E didn't last long either, merging with CSX shortly after its creation. In 1991, CSX sold its one-third share of the Monongahela, and Conrail became its sole owner. By 1993, the Interstate Commerce Commission gave permission for the Monongahela to be swallowed by the Conrail monster, and despite all its success, the Monongahela Railway disappeared on May 1, 1993. Conrail itself didn't last through the decade, being jointly acquired in 1999 by CSX and Norfolk Southern, and its assets split between them. Today, the Monongahela property has now passed to Norfolk Southern, who shares the lines with CSX. Both companies' trains can be found along the old Monongahela, which is now only known as the MGA Mine District. However, the railroad does live on in spirit, as the Norfolk Southern runs one of its ES-44 AC Heritage Units, number 8025, in the old Monongahela Gray paint scheme.
Coming up now on the Besco Street crossing. To our left, rising along the hillside, is the town of Pitgas, Pennsylvania. Pitgas's only claim to fame is that it's the home of the Clyde Coal Company's Swinging Bridge. It used to cross from the Clyde Coal Mine in Pitgas, just to our left, to a company-built shantytown on the other side of the river. Miners cross the bridge every day to and from work. The bridge was built in 1900 and was abandoned when the mine closed in the mid-20th century probably in the mid-1960s, when a large number of mines in the area closed down. Locals continued to hang out on the bridge well into the 80s, though now it's fallen into such disrepair it's impossible to cross. Main Street still beneath us there, and we're going to follow it around this bend in the river. It's going to lead us into a couple of small communities along the riverbank here, Williamstown and Clarksville. Also, as we come around this little horseshoe curb, we're going to be encountering the first of two double-tracked passing sidings. Now, from what I understand, these didn't exist in the 50s. Uh, they were built much later, and I would assume during the 1968 construction, of the uh, or the extension of the Waynesburg Southern Branch. With all the added traffic coming from the mines down at the state line, they would have had to add these passing sidings so that they could maintain train volume up and down the line. During my research, I was reading the comments of one guy who grew up apparently in the area, and he remembered as a kid that trains would wait for hours at either end, at the terminal ends of the line, you know, waiting for the, for the single tracked line to clear before they could go up and down. So. Obviously that was solved here by putting in this siding and then we'll encounter another one after we hit the Wayne Tunnel uh, a little bit closer to Waynesburg. Yellow signal for us coming into the passing siding. We've got a red up ahead at the end. We're going to have to wait for an incoming train coming down the mountain. We'll wait for them to pass before we continue going up. Also, as we're hitting the siding here, we're now in Williamstown, which is going to be coming up on our right. Off to our left, just barely visible, if at all, through the trees, is the Clyde Mine Swinging Bridge, and that would be right in the vicinity of that dirt road. Over the top of Main Street now, and Williamstown is to our right. There used to be another large mine dump off to the left, though now you can see it's only a small water treatment plant.
We're about to come up on a bridge across a fork in the Ten Mile Creek. We will continue following the South Fork of the Ten Mile, and on our right is Clarksville, Pennsylvania. Clarksville was the site of the murder of labor union leader Joseph Yablonski in 1969. Yablonski was a prominent leader in the United Mine Workers Union, and he clashed constantly with President Tony Boyle, including accusing Boyle of election fraud. Boyle embezzled union funds to hire three amateur hitmen to kill Yablonski. On December 31, 1969, the three men entered Yablonski's home and shot him, his wife, and his 25-year-old daughter. The bodies were discovered five days later by Yablonski's son. The next day, 20,000 miners walked off the job in a one-day strike to draw national attention to Boyle, who they were convinced was responsible. All three gunmen were caught within days. Two of the three received death sentences for what they'd done. It took five years, but Boyle was finally convicted in 1974 and was sentenced to life in prison, where he died in 1985. Yablonski's death led to major reforms in the mining union and was important enough to be portrayed in three different movies, one even starring Charles Bronson. We're crossing under the Clarksville Road Bridge as it climbs off to our left up the hill heading south out of town and to our right it connects with the small neighborhood of Braden Plan which I think now is probably a part of Clarksville I'm not exactly sure at the time it might have been its own borough but uh, it's literally only a neighborhood of, of five roads Castile Run Road is now right alongside us with the 10 Mile Creek on the far side of that and we can see the bridge that crosses over the creek into an even smaller neighborhood called Burson Plan. So that one behind us was Braden Plan, this is Burson Plan, that's literally three roads. And again, not sure what community it was originally associated with, but I assume now it's probably part of Clarksville. Keeping an eye out for the red signal up ahead around this sort of a blind curve through the trees, we're down to 17 miles an hour and I'm applying the brakes to get us down. We have a lot of train to stop we do not want to overrun this red signal. There it is. I also want to stop short of that crossing because then there's, there's no reason to block the road. We'll be sitting here for a few minutes. We're stopped just short of the crossing before the end of the passing siding. The 10 mile south fork is to our right with the village of Braden Plan on the far side. The road that crosses in front of us leads off to our left to the Edwards Shaft Portal, a large mine with its associated mine dump behind it on the flats. All these mine dumps we've been seeing along the way are called slate piles here in western PA and in West Virginia. Some places call them gob piles, and out east, in the anthracite coal fields around Scranton, they were called culm piles, C-U-L-M. Whatever the local term was, they were enormous piles of waste rock that surrounded coal veins. Once it was separated from the coal, which, even in the 40s, was still often being done by hand, the useless slate was dumped into one of these waste piles. The piles were dangerous, though. Mixed in with the rock, was a fair amount of coal that couldn't be separated or was too low grade to sell. After a period of time, maybe 10 to 15 years, pressure from the weight of the slate pile would create enough heat to ignite the waste coal deep in its depths. A slate pile would burn until all of its combustible materials were used up, which, depending on the size of the pile, could take years. The red glow from smoldering slate piles could often be seen at night. Left to burn unregulated outside, these dumps were pouring coal pollution into the air, ground, and water of nearby communities. Additionally, something that no one even knew about for a long time, burning coal produces radiation, as it contains thorium and uranium. With these elements left to fly on the wind or leach into the ground, slate piles have been irradiating communities with more radiation than living next to an actual nuclear power plant. 
Once they burned out, though, slate piles would sometimes be reclaimed by the mining companies, as the rock could be used in construction projects. Green signal as the helper locomotive on the end of the eastbound train passes by us on their way back down to Brownsville. So we are clear to get underway once again. We have the highball. Reverser, full forward. Sander on for traction. And I think that we're on a little bit of an incline here. So this might be a hill start. Not a very big one, but just enough. So we're going to have to watch and be careful that we don't get wheel slip or that the weight of the train isn't going to... Uh, to drag us back. So uh, while the brakes are releasing, opening the throttle up 30%. And uh, there we are. We are already rolling. And we're almost, uh, yeah, we're up to four miles an hour already on our way up to five. So things are looking pretty good so far. There's 5.2. And it's, uh, okay, it's swinging back down, so maybe we just hit the full weight of the train. So I'm going to go ahead and open the regulator to 50%. Get a little more power to the cylinders. The speed limit here is still 20, so we have plenty of room to work with. Get the train up to speed, not be worried about being hampered by low speed limits again like, like at the beginning. Uh, we're up to 6.3 miles an hour. Looks like we're holding steady there. So I'm going to open the throttle up to 75%. And then we'll bring the reverser actually down to 75% as well. And speed is still increasing. So uh, it looks like there was nothing to worry about. We're rolling pretty easily here at this point. So actually, maybe there is not an incline here, which I guess would make sense. That would be a good place to build a passing siding on a fairly level patch of ground. And that's it, we're back out over the switch onto the uh, single track main line, which is totally clear for us all the way up to uh, Waynesburg. And this is the halfway point, so we still have some distance to go.
We are continuing along the Ten Mile South Fork, passing the town of Chartiers on our right. This is the town that gave the Chartiers Southern Railroad its name, which is what became the Ten Mile Branch that we're now driving on. So, last episode I talked about keeping the fire mass at between 50 to 75 percent full to burn the coal most efficiently. And like the boiler water discussion earlier, it's actually not true in real life. It's a little more nuanced than that. But the simplified physics of this locomotive here in the game make it an okay rule of thumb. Because really we don't need to concern ourselves with the details of firing a real engine. The Locomotive Engineman's Manual, written by W.P. James in 1919, is over 400 pages long. Firing the Steam Locomotive was another book, written by the Reading Railroad in 1947, outlining the duties of just the firemen alone, and that was still 180 pages. Firing steam locomotives was an art. The shape and the thickness of the fire itself was important. How it was distributed, evenly or unevenly, in the firebox would affect the draft and affect the temperature of the fire. So we should be paying attention to the color and the temperature of the fire, the color of the smoke. We should be shaking the grates to clear ash out of the firebox. And the boiler safety valves should ideally never be lifting because the fire should always be carried as light as possible. But, like I said before, this is an older model, and many people have complaints about it because it is so simple. The physics upgrade, I found, helps a lot. In fact, before, you couldn't even open the cylinder cocks. Even so, the engine still has fundamental problems that just can't be solved. A new locomotive just needs to be made from the ground up. Here's some other examples. The amount of coal in the firebox doesn't actually matter most of the time either full at 1500 pounds or down at 500 pounds, the safety valve still lifts if the throttle is closed. Smoke is either black when the stoker is on and white when it's off. There's no way to properly feed coal and not have it turn black. If you're really eagle-eyed, you'll already have noticed that the cab interior is for an oil burning engine. It's not even for a coal locomotive and we can't even see into the fire. Luckily, these videos that I'm making here are more for the history and fun, uh, and not so much for the realism of actually driving the locomotive. It's more about seeing it. But having said that, the game itself is capable of handling it if the developers just made the effort. And that's been proven by the Smokebox 484, which does actually simulate many of the details of steam train operations. Uh, fire color, smoke color, the amount of oil going into the, into the fire, and all that. So. And apparently that same company is working on releasing a big boy soon as well, so maybe someday I can do another huge articulated engine series, and then maybe at that point we can take a proper look at uh, true operations a little bit closer of a, of a big engine like that. But in the meantime, we don't have that option, so I'm just sort of going to play it fast and loose with the truth here, <laughs> and try to mention when things maybe are sort of realistic, but I'm also not going to kill myself trying to uh, trying to drive it to the letter because there's no point.
So one of the cool things about this route, because it follows the uh, the winding 10-mile creek, is that we get a lot of these mini horseshoe curves, you know, going around these tight bends in the river. This one, I think, is, is my favorite. I think this is the coolest of all of them because it's so wide, and it's got the steel girder bridge going across the creek and under the tracks. That's Mall Road, and uh, it's going to cross right underneath us as we go around the apex uh, of the curve here. Besides being big, the foliage is light enough on the far side that we're going to be able to see around the curve and see the, the back of, well, not the back of our train, but uh, <laughs> further further back along the train and see some of the cars on the opposite uh, side. And that's always just such a neat visual thing to see. I like it a lot. So this is my favorite curve, I think, on the route, is this mall road curve. So coming into the turn here is milepost 75 at the front of the train. We're going to go back to the caboose and we're back here at milepost 74, which is uh, just coming around back through the mall road curve again. So now we're looking out of the caboose and we can see the, uh, the cars in front of us as they're making their way around the curve and we can see them way off there in the distance still, which is, like I said, just such a neat visual thing to see. and snaking around yet another horseshoe curve, another bend in the river. The tracks are actually pretty level here. We're at 19 miles an hour, slowly bleeding speed just a little bit. I've got the throttle open at 51%, but the reverser is pulled way back to 5%, so I mean almost neutral. 
and uh, just a couple of clicks forward will get my speed back up you know so I'm just maintaining right under 20 miles an hour so really this locomotive actually isn't working uh, all that hard and uh, you can see the fire mass is down under 700 pounds and honestly I'm just gonna let it keep dropping um, again in that spirit of trying to keep the fire as light as possible for the amount of work that the locomotive is doing I mean boiler pressure is still maxed out and I can't stop the safety of hell from lifting so I don't know how low the fire mass is going to go before it finally conks out on me, but I will probably, probably maintain between, I don't know, 500 and 1,000 pounds, I guess, just arbitrarily, just to keep something in there. That'll be good. But yeah, if you look at uh, steam chest pressure, we've only got a little over 3 pounds of steam going to the cylinders, so that's all that's keeping us going right now. And uh, of course it takes more power to get a train moving than to keep it moving so that's sort of where we're at now we're just in this steady state of uh, maintaining speed just under 20 miles an hour the town of Jefferson is to our left up on top of the hill and it was named after Thomas Jefferson this town was the site of Monongahela College, the first Baptist college in western Pennsylvania. It operated from 1869 until 1894. Just after we cross over Chartier's Road, a small freight station and the Mather House Track provided railroad deliveries to the area. Mather is the town across the river to our right. Up the hill to our left is the Jefferson Morgan High School, and in modern times an elementary school is there as well. Mather was the home to one of the largest coal mines in Greene County, and across the river to our right you can still see the remains of the huge slate dumps from the mine. The mine was owned and operated by Pickard's Mather and Company from 1917 to 1965. Just ahead, a railroad spur cut off to cross the river to service the mine, and the remains of the railroad bridge still lies half collapsed in the river. A three-track yard ran along the entire length of the slate piles, and a large tipple complex loaded train cars. The Mather Mine suffered an explosion in 1928 that killed 195 miners, making it the site of the seventh largest mine disaster in the U.S. and the second largest in Pennsylvania. At 4.07 in the afternoon, a spark from a battery-powered underground locomotive ignited a combination of methane gas and coal dust. Of the 209 miners in the area of the explosion, only 14 would escape to safety.
Now we're at an interesting double bridge over the Ten Mile Creek, which doubles back in a loop and flows back under the second bridge. In the middle, we cross under Jefferson Road, coming out of downtown Jefferson on its way to Waynesburg, which is only about five miles away now. And look at that, we have a little friend up there on Jefferson Road. We'll give him a little toot and say hello. And then we're back over the 10 Mile Creek, which is something you're going to hear me say about a billion times before this run is over. Uh, one of the interesting things about this route is the fact that it doesn't linearly have a grade up. We're not just constantly climbing. We're actually going over a series of up and downs and up and downs. And so with a train this long, we're never actually 100% on a single grade at any moment. So what I mean by that is that half the train might be going uphill and the other half might be going downhill. Or we might even be over a series of three hills all at the same time obviously very gradual uh, inclines, you know, we're not, there's nothing too steep here, but uh, with the momentum of the train already moving, that is only helping us keep the train in a very steady state. We're sort of not being affected as much by going uphill because the weight of the part of the train that's in the downhill sections are continuing to push us. Our heavy, heavy weight, sort of like a, like a ship, you know, like an aircraft carrier on the ocean, our weight is just so great that we're just sort of plowing through and uh, it's harder and harder to be affected by like gravity or by inclines so you know that's sort of a good thing I think that's helping us keep that very low um, that 5% reverser at the moment and obviously if we were allowed to go much faster too that would be a different story because if I could really crank this thing up you know keep it up by 40 miles an hour we would have uh, much bigger concerns with maintaining steam pressure and obviously if we if we were much heavier that would be a different story too so even on the way back down we're gonna see that even though we're gonna have a slight downhill advantage the throttles still gonna have to be open pretty wide on this locomotive to keep us going so we're gonna see a completely different fuel usage and and all that stuff on, on the way down just because we're gonna be uh, whatever it is eight and a half thousand tons instead of the uh, 3500 that we are here Back over the creek yet again, and over the Crane School Road crossing on the far side. Just to the right of the crossing, almost next to the tracks, was the entrance to another small coal mine. It was one of three on just this small bend in the river alone. The river's on our left now, with Creek Road paralleling us on the far shore. Another mine entrance was along that road. Just to our right on the hill was a vertical air shaft down to the mines. So it's just been crazy looking at the uh, the old maps of the area along these tracks, and I sort of can't stress enough just how many coal mines there were everywhere, or maybe even just entrances to the same mines, 
but they were everywhere. They stretched under the Monongahela River. They probably stretched under the Ten Mile Creek. Like I said, that curve behind us had literally four coal mine entrances around it, the one to our right and three to our left. There's several more to our left across the creek there along the road. We have air shafts over to our right. There's air shafts back in, like, the outskirts of some of the little mining communities. Like, just the coal mines were everywhere, and uh, it seems like so many of them shut down around the same time as the Mather Mine, so that, like, 65 to, like, 68 uh, or maybe even 1970 area of time, just so many of them just shut down and were done. And in many cases, you would hardly even know that they were there. Ahead of us, just poking out of the trees up on the hilltop, is another prison, the now-defunct Waynesburg State Correctional Facility. It began life as a youth correction facility, and in 1984 it reopened as a minimum security women's prison. In 1992 it switched to a men's prison with a capacity of 450 prisoners. It was closed in 2003, and the property was purchased by the Basalt Trap Rock Company for a million dollars. Getting back to abandoned coal mines, uh, it's a very interesting thing that these mines, when spent, it's not like they get refilled back in. They literally just get abandoned. I mean, maybe the entrances get filled in a little bit, but hundreds and hundreds of miles still go, you know, beneath our feet. So, I, I think I've mentioned this before, I live in Scranton now. I'm not from here, but I've lived here the last you know, four or five years. And from what I understand, underneath my house is several hundred feet down of level after level after level of crisscrossing coal mines. And uh, every now and then, somebody's, like, backyard caves in because you have a mine collapse, you know, somewhere way down in the ground. And that's just crazy. Like, basically, at any moment, like, your house could fall into a sinkhole because some mine tunnel 400 feet down collapsed after, you know, 100 years. So I'm guessing it's very similar out here in uh, southwestern PA, in this Brownsville, Waynesburg area. The entire countryside is just crisscrossed with uh, mine tunnels that no one can see and no one bothers to think about them even being there because it's been uh, 60 years, you know, since anyone has worked in them and less and less people even remember that they're there. So in a few moments we're coming up on the Wayne Tunnel, and as a steam locomotive we have a couple of extra precautions that we have to take before we get into that tunnel. Tunnels can cause backdrafts through the boiler, and uh, we don't want fire coming out into the cab and killing our crew or, you know, or, or injuring someone, if not death. So we have to make sure that the fire door is completely closed, and we got to make sure that the blower is on. So we're maintaining a positive draft through the firebox and out the front of the locomotive, and not out through the back. Now, I don't know if in real life the effects are different between a fast train going through a long tunnel or a slow train going through a short tunnel, but here in the game, no matter what speed you're at, the game will, or the scenario will end because it'll tell you that the crew has died. So we have to do these things no matter what, but I would assume that the effects would be not as bad for a slow train going through a short tunnel, which is what we are going to be doing in just a second here. The Wayne Tunnel was built in 1929 as part of the extension of the 10-mile branch to reach Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. It's a short, curving tunnel 
that punches through the hill rather than following the creek's loop to the left. As we come out of the tunnel, we'll pass back over the creek. In the darkness of the Wayne Tunnel now, and it is curving to the right, so that sort of makes it feel like it's longer than it is, but there's the entrance dead ahead. I can see daylight, and I think we're going to make it. Yes, back out into daylight and over the trestle over the 10 mile creek and on the far side of the bridge we are now in the second set of double tracked passing sightings on the route up to Waynesburg uh, these ones obviously just before the tunnel so any trains heading down the mountain would stop prior to the tunnel and wait for any traffic to pass them before proceeding On our right, we're meeting back up with Jefferson Road, or Route 88, and we've got a pumping station for a gas company over there. This crossing is an unnamed road, which originally led up into the hill to our left to service two gas wells. The next crossing leads up to the left to another prison. This one is the Green Supermax prison. Green opened in 1993 and houses 150 death row prisoners. That's around 80% of the state's total death sentence prisoners. Despite this number, only three prisoners have been executed since the 70s. The most recent was 1999. In 2015, the governor of Pennsylvania suspended death penalties pending a reassessment of the costs an implementation of the system.
passing the Peat Siding now, which serves a small industrial area and a gas well. Just beyond the siding is Route 79, a highway which connects West Virginia to Pittsburgh by way of Washington, Pennsylvania. The highway was opened in the late 70s. On the far side of the overpass, we're entering the outskirts of Waynesburg. Now actually in Waynesburg, we're approaching the Greene County Fairgrounds on our left. The fair opened on these grounds in 1911 and featured livestock, home and garden exhibits, and horse racing on the oval track. In 1912, the county's first air show was held on the grounds, though pilot Joe Stevenson crashed on takeoff during the second day. By the 1920s, barnstormers were giving biplane rides to the public and auto racing was introduced. A Ferris wheel could be ridden for five cents. The fair continues annually today due to the area's strong agricultural industry. The local pen dot, or Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, is to our left in this little industrial area. East High Street crosses under us, leading into the downtown of Waynesburg. Waynesburg is the county seat of Greene County and was established in 1796. It was named for General Anthony Wayne, a fiery Pennsylvanian general during the Revolutionary War whose reputation earned him the nickname Mad Anthony. The city has maintained a population of around four to 5,000 during the 20th and 21st centuries, with its highest of 5,500 recorded in 1950. On the north side of town, Waynesburg University hosts 1,800 students. The school was founded in 1849 by the Presbyterian Church and remains a private Christian university today. Two of the buildings on campus have been designated as National Historic Buildings. Waynesburg was also the terminal of the Waynesburg and Washington, a narrow gauge railroad built in 1877. This is South Porter Street. And on our right, next to the tracks, is the college football field, which was also the original location of the Greene County Fair in the 1800s. As we come around the corner, we're coming into what was at one time the Waynesburg Freight Yards. The tracks originally curved to the right to follow the right side of 1st Street. 
the construction of the Waynesburg Southern Branch in 1968 moved the tracks to their current position. Just after we pass under Morgan Street was the location of the original Waynesburg and Washington passenger stations. And the freight spur that we see here was the original route of the W&W, &W, remaining on the east side of the river as it ran north to Washington. Finally, we have reached our destination, entering the siding now for the Emerald Mine. The mine opened in 1977, almost 10 years after the Waynesburg Southern Branch was constructed, so the tracks already passed the site. It was closed down in 2015. The mine's owner, Alpha Natural Resources, also owns the Cumberland Mine south of Waynesburg and transferred some of its employees to the other location, laying off the remaining 300. The mine was closed due to almost being spent, nearing the end of its reserves, although secondary reasons included a sagging coal market and environmental regulations. Prior to 1977, the only thing on this hillside was a baseball field, named the Emerald Ballpark, and a small road that ran up the hill next to it. Today, the only remains of that time is the abandoned steel bridge crossing the river in front of the mine, which used to connect Route 21 with the ballpark. That bridge is portrayed here in the game as being in good condition, but in reality, it's rusty, completely unusable, and hidden off in the weeds. There's also no crossing here, as the road doesn't exist anymore. The Emerald Ballpark was moved just to the west, next to a now-defunct drive-in theater, where it sits today. So there's that bridge that I was talking about. See, it looks like it's still in use, in perfectly good shape. And uh, go to Google Maps to this location, and it's very hard to even find that bridge. And once you do, it just looks like garbage. And uh, this road is not here. There is a road that does go up the hill, which is sort of in the same location as the original one. But the uh, I think the the Emerald Ballpark would have been like right here, just to our left. And of course now there's uh, no trace of it. It's been moved over just a little bit to the west. And actually now, you know, I'm recording this in 2020. And uh, the thing closed like five years ago. So I don't even, I couldn't even tell you what is physically there anymore. If any of this stuff exists or if it's just like a big, you know, slate pile. I could not tell you. Slowly making our way through the first tipple, looking up into the, the office, 
Nobody manning the loading office there at the moment. We're not going to stop at this one. We're going to proceed down to the second one because I'm, our train is just so long. We, we have to clear the other track so that that passenger train can get into Waynesburg. Now, in real life, it would not be a Pennsylvania Railroad uh, K4 sitting there. That's just representing what would be a Waynesburg and Washington train instead. Sometime in the, uh, I think it's the 30s, oh no, it was 40s, it was for the war effort, the Waynesburg and Washington, with money from the Pennsylvania Railroad, upgraded their tracks from narrow gauge to standard gauge, and so actually during this time, which I'm sort of loosely suggesting is 1950, uh, these there would have been standard gauge trains coming down from Washington and uh, into Waynesburg, but it still would have been the W&W &W Railroad, so that's what we would have seen there. But of course, I don't have any locomotives or rolling stock from there, so uh, or from that company. So I just used a Pennsylvania stand-in instead. Look at these monster structures we're going by. All these conveyors and everything, they're moving all this coal, you know, uh, almost a mile out here to this other tipple. I always find huge engineering projects very impressive when things are just enormous. Okay, bell is on for safety as we're approaching the second tipple, which is going to be our destination. So we're going to pull through it, through the chute, out to the other side, and uh, going to start applying the brakes now because we need to stop this very <laughs> this very heavy train. So slight application of the brakes, and we're going to let it come down as we cruise through and come to a halt on the other side. Down to nine miles an hour now. Jockeying the brakes a little bit. Release, reapply. We're definitely clear back out in the sunlight on the other side, so we're just going to let the brakes apply to their full pressure and let the train grind to a halt. We have successfully brought our mile-long train to our destination, the Emerald Mine, in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. We're at 938 feet above sea level here, after beginning in West Brownsville at 776. That's a total elevation change of 162 feet, and spread out over 27 miles, that's an average grade of 0.18%. That's really not very bad, not exactly climbing the Rockies. But it's also not linear, we actually encountered some grades of up to 0.3% in spots along the way. On a 0.25% grade, a train has double the resistance to being pulled than it has on level track, so potentially we could have had some problems. But luckily we didn't, and today ended up being a fairly easy run. This is the end of episode 2, as no doubt it's going to take a couple of hours to fill the hoppers with coal, 
and of course the crew will want to grab some lunch in town. So we'll head back down the mountains in episode 3, where I'll also take the time to talk about the Waynesburg and Washington Railroad in more detail, the Manor Branch, and anything else I didn't have time for along the way in this episode. We'll have a slight downhill, that 0.18% grade will be in our favor, but our Clinchfield Challenger is still going to have to haul 8,500 tons of coal. So, it should be fun, and should keep our hands full. We'll see you then. Music